Laura Grimm. We are a diverse community that welcomes you as you are, regardless of your age, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, gender, identity, economic status, or physical ability. We come together to seek deeper meaning and understanding from each other and from the world around us. Your presence here today is a gift that brings us closer to that understanding. We are an active community that lives its values beyond the hours of Sunday services, and I'd like to call your attention to the following. Save the date. Learn how to save money on home improvements, repairs, and appliances on October 3rd at 6.30 p.m. at the UUFWC when architect Hallie Bowie speaks about moving to clean energy and how the inf Inflation Reduction Act can help. Also, next Sunday, October 6th, join the humanists in the large group room to hear Phil Grimm, that guy over there, share a presentation about the Wayne County Park District. Please look inside of your bulletin for more information regarding events and activities taking place at the UUFWC. Oh, good morning, friends. Am I on? No. I'm not on. Do I have to use my actor voice? Let's try it. It's the actor voice when the mic is on. There we go. Good morning, friends. It is so wonderful that you decided, despite the cloudy, overcast day, to get out of the snuggliest place in the world and join us here for worship. Today's kind of a special sermon for me. Oh, no, because my batteries are dead. <laughs> my batteries are dead. I need your batteries. Chris and all the work that he does. To be able to do all of the tech work, it's one of those things that you don't notice it until it doesn't work. It's kind of like your toilet in your house. Um, and he does a lot of great work. But I want to talk today, what we're going to be talking today is something that's very near and dear to my heart. We're going to be talking about welcoming the stranger. This is a tale that goes back in so many faith traditions and is important to not only help ourselves grow, but to make this world a better place. And we have seen a lot recently that demonizes the stranger. And we're going to confront that a little bit today. So we might be going a little long. Warning now if you've got brunch reservations. And I won't hold anybody responsible if they walk out early. But... A little long is a good thing. I don't know. But thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being amongst people who want to be better. Thank you for all that you do to make this world a better place. You are loved. Please put your phones in worship mode. Open your hearts. Open your minds. And join us for worship.
Our chalice lighting this morning is we gather to draw a wider circle by Reverend Gretchen Halley. In a world that feeds on moral outrage, we are here to cultivate moral courage. In a time that prizes picking sides, we gather to draw a wider circle. In a culture that teaches us to get for what we give and to ask, what's in it for me? We come to practice generosity and to remember that we are all in this together. In the midst of life's bitterness, we choose to sing and give thanks to laugh together, to be keepers of beauty, and to offer a place of belonging for all who come in gladness and in pain, to resist the push to the next and then the next, to slow down, to breathe more deeply, to feel a part of something greater. For this hour and in this space, let us be the change that we wish to see. Let us worship together. And now, let us rise in body or spirit as we sing our opening hymn, Break Not the Circle. Words are on the screen, number 323 in the gray hymnal. invite any children or youth or anyone that would like to get closer to the story to come on up on the stage with me. Come on up. You can bring, if you're coloring or holding something, you're welcome to bring it with you. All right. Hi. Hello, hello. All right. Good morning. Hello. All right. Come on up. It's okay. You can come this way. Come on. Benjamin, get over here. Help me out, man. All right, good morning. Well, today's story is a fable, and I wondered if some of you have learned about fables in school. Have you ever read a fable? No, not familiar with a fable? Okay. What if I said the tortoise and the hare, or the city mouse and the country mouse? You've heard of some of those? Yeah. So a fable is a short story that's supposed to teach us a lesson or a moral. And the ones that are most famous are Aesop's fables. Does anyone remember Aesop's fables? Yeah, those were written like 600 years ago, but a lot of them still stand the test of time. But today's fable is actually a modern fable. It was written in 1999, which to me seems like it's not very old, but to you it seems very old. Okay, so this fable was written in modern times by R. Roosevelt Thomas, and it was written for adults. So adults, be listening to this. It was written for you. It was written for adults in the workplace to think about um, how things go in the workplace. Um, that's all I'll say about that. So, you sure can. I was just about to ask you to. What's in the Wonder Box? A picture of a giraffe. Oh, let me get my mic. Hold that thought, Hawthorne. What's in there? 
A picture of a giraffe and an elephant. A picture of a giraffe and an elephant. Well, that's perfect because this fable is called The Giraffe and the Elephant. So once there was a giraffe. No, one, one more thing. I'll back up. The thing about fables is, is it usually people in the stories? No. It's usually animals, right? And they can do human-like things, like they can talk. I just wanted to make sure you understood that before I say that this giraffe built a house. Okay, you just have to accept it. Okay? This, exactly a really big one. This giraffe wanted to build the perfect giraffe house for him and his family. And he was a woodworker, so this was a great job for him. All right? But he's really tall. So what kinds of things might need to be in a giraffe house to make sure it suits him well? What do you think? Food. Some food in his house that's leaves. appropriate for a giraffe? Leaves, to be exact. Cause, leaves. Cause leaves. Because they are vegetarians, yes? Meat that he stored. You think he might store some meat? Maybe if he has some guests, he might need that. What do you think about? Wait, is this how he built the house or what do you mean? Either one. But let's think about building the house. Like, what might it be shaped like? A high ceiling, one said. It would have, like, really, really, you could use, like, against, like, trees. Oh, okay. You could use trees to help build it. Okay, Hawthorne? A huge bed. A really long bed. Yeah. Made out of wood. Made out of wood. Okay. Really, really long. Very long and tall, right? Like a giraffe. All right? So he built this amazing giraffe house. It had really tall doorways that were nice and skinny for a giraffe to fit through. The windows were up high so he could look out of the windows. The hallways were very narrow because he's, you know, giraffes in the grand scheme of things are pretty narrow animals. All right? It was an amazing house. And he built a woodworking shop attached to it because he loved to do woodworking. So one day, he's working in his wood shop and he looks out the window and there's an elephant walking by and he knows this guy. He sticks his head on the hey, elephant. You're a woodworker too, aren't you? That's awesome, I wanna show you my wood shop. It is so cool. And he's been wanting to make friends with this elephant forever. So he says, I want you to come to my house and my wood shop. You are welcome to come anytime. In fact, why don't you stop in today? Elephants, like that sounds cool to me. All right, so the elephant comes and he's ready to enter the house. And he puts one of those big elephant feet on the front porch and what do you think happens? <laughs> crushes right through it. Elephants are very big, heavy animals. But the giraffe says, no worries, man. It's OK. It's all right. Just come on in. So he went to go through the giraffe door. Do you think he fit? No. No, he did not fit. And that was frustrating. But giraffe is a problem solver. He's like, we can make this work. I want you to be in my home. I want to welcome you. So we're going to solve this problem. And he had some ideas. All right, here's his first idea. All right, elephant, I have an idea. You could go on like an elephant diet and get like really skinny. And then you'd be able to walk through my front door. And elephant was like, I don't really know about that. That doesn't really sound like a good plan. And then the giraffe said, oh, I have another idea. You could take some ballet classes. And then you would be very light on your feet, right? Like a ballerina. And then you wouldn't crunch my porch anymore. And the elephant was like, I don't really know about that either. What do you think? Maybe they could use bricks. Oh, maybe they could use different materials that would work better for both the elephant and the giraffe. I love that idea. You said they were both woodworkers, right? Yes. They could both build a new house that was bigger. So they could work as a team to build a building that was more comfortable for everybody to walk in? That's yes. genius. Future engineer here. They could make the door bigger. They could enlarge the door. That would make more sense than telling an elephant to go on a diet, right? But how about, yeah. but how about the inside? But all he offered was for the elephant to get skinnier, or take ballet classes. And I have to ask you, if you were the elephant, even though the giraffe was saying, I want you in my home, you are welcome here. Would you feel very welcome if you can't walk in the door? No. No, no. no there's no way to feel welcome if you can't even come in and be a part of things. And so the elephant said, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that a house designed for a giraffe 
will ever really work for an elephant unless there are major changes. You guys are so good, you were already thinking ahead. I was going to ask you, what are some things that could be done to make it work for both of them? And you already had some great ideas. Were there any other thoughts on what could be done so it could work for both the elephant and the giraffe? They could make it more like sturdy with poles or something. They could use stronger materials to make it sturdier. If they used bricks, some they, there might be a hole, so they might cut a hole. So if the elephant like stomps and makes the crackle go where the where the line was. Aha, that makes sense. Okay, Julian, is your hand up? Yeah. Um, they could make the hallways and the door bigger. And like, okay. Because an elephant couldn't fit through those small giraffe holes. Absolutely not. Or you could put like you could make the elephant walk through and then if he crushed the things you just rebuild it the way he crushed them. Okay, we, we could just make some repairs. Alright, one more idea on that. You can make a house to, with the elephant. You can make a house for the elephant. Yeah. Okay. Like maybe it could be beside the giraffe house yeah. or maybe they could be connected somehow. So many cool ideas. So those are some things we're going to be talking about today in this room and in our classrooms. What does it mean to truly be welcoming? Is it enough to just say it? Or do we need to show it and prove it? Okay. All right, thank you for joining me for the story. Uh, we're gonna sing our kids and youth out to classes now. Please join me now in the spirit of meditation and a prayer. My heart breaks for this planet. To see the hurricanes that have battered our southern shores. To know the devastation that has caused and is awfully often the brunt is bared by the least fortunate among us. And to know at some level that this devastation is caused by us, the damage we have done to our planet, the ease and convenience that we have grown so accustomed to damaging the most vulnerable. I pray that as a country, that as people, that as a planet, we become stronger. I pray that we see the value of the earth that sustains us. I pray we learn to work in concert with the elements, to find ways that keep us healthy and alive and by us I mean all of us. And that's why we gather. We are here to be better. We are here to spread the message of hope in this world. We are here to care for all. May we learn to love this planet. May we learn to show others the importance of that love. And may we never stop fighting to protect all of us. May it be so. I want to lift up 
some of the folks in our community. Some of you may know that Sue Gross is getting knee surgery this week. If you know Sue Gross, you know she's taking care of herself. She's got a good network around her. You wish her strength, love, and we know she's got support around her. But that doesn't excuse you from mailing her cards to wish her well. Dan O'Rourke has been moved to the Burbank Park Scaling and Nursing Rehabilitation Center. Dan loves to have visitors. And Dan can get exhausted pretty quick. So understand that just because your visit may be brief doesn't mean it isn't valued. And always, it's always good to check with Denise first. And speaking of Denise. Denise was awarded the Donald H. Eckroyd Outstanding Teacher in Higher Education Award, Teacher of the Year. It is so wonderful to have a person like Denise in our midst, especially someone who fights so much about justice and equality and teaches it to others. We are proud to have Denise be a part of our congregation and especially proud that she is a volunteer for religious education, keeping that spirit alive. We all come in here each week to refresh our hearts, our souls, by being in community with each other. We love each other, and there's good reason why. If there is something that weighs on your soul, something that is hard for you, a burden that you are carrying, I encourage you as we sing Spirit of Life to come up, to take a stone and to put that sorrow, that worry onto this stone and drop it in the water, letting the water wash it away in the support of this community. And if there is something that lifts your heart, a joy that you have been carrying, I encourage you to do the same. Put it on this stone, place it in the water, and let that joy ripple out to our community. Sue is here with our lay pastoral care team. If you would like to meet with Sue to talk about something that is on your soul, your heart, your mind, she's a great person to talk to. And she would love to meet with you. And if you'd like to meet with me through the week, let me know. Come take my hands, whisper in my ear, and I will set up a time to meet with you. But please, join us now in our Joys and Sorrows ritual as we sing Spirit of Life.
Our faith is centered on the belief that we can make this world a better place for all who dwell in it. In order to realize that vision, we need both the motivation and the means. Your donation helps the community put its faith into action by supporting our programming and facilities. This morning and throughout the month of September, all donations collected that are not specifically marked otherwise will be split with the People to People Ministries. People to People Ministries is a nonprofit ministry that offers food, shelter, and clothing to people in need. We thank you for your donation toward the mission and the vision of this community. The offering will now be collected and gratefully received. I just want to. I just want to say very quickly that um, I don't know. I'm emotional. This is crazy. Elizabeth Alexander actually um, was invited by Joe Downs years ago to come to this UU, and she is now a very famous and wonderful um, UU choral composer.
unison reading as we dedicate our offering. The words are on the screen. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. Let us be grateful even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Our reading this morning is by Christine Walters Painter. Carl Jung once said in a BBC interview that he began calling God as those things who cross my willful path violently and recklessly and change the course of my life for better or for worse. The divine is that power which disrupts everything. So, what if our practice were to court a holy disruption? To welcome in everything which challenges my perspective on how the world works and upsets all the plans I have for myself and turns them on their heads? What if when life started falling apart, I opened my heart to welcome in the grief and fear that arrived as well and considered them as holy guides? What if all the painful feelings of loss and disorientation were invited to tea and tenderness? What if everything that turns our preconceived ideas inside out is precisely where we find God. I heard a story this last week that really moved my heart. And I want to share it with you this morning. It comes from Dr. Martin Shaw, who is a writer, storyteller, and mythologist from the United Kingdom. And the story is called The Fox Woman. This is somewhat of an oral tradition story, so there are no exact words. But I think you'll get the idea. There was a hunter who was returning from a long day of hunting in the woods. And as he approaches the clearing to his house, he notices that there's smoke coming from his chimney. And this is unusual because the hunter lives alone and has lived alone for quite some time. He carefully opens the door to his house, curious and cautious. And he sees there's a fire in his fireplace. On top of the fire sits his cooking pot, filled with a thick brown stew. He notices that the clutter in his cabin has been tidied up, the dishes washed, the counters scrubbed, the laundry clean, folded, mended at the foot of his bed. He goes to the cooking pot and he takes a deep breath of the stew and as the odor of onions and cumin fills his lungs. He cautiously takes a small spoonful and tastes it. <sighs> Magnificent. His hunger trumps his cautiousness and he fixes himself a bowl of stew and eats and satisfied he goes to bed for the night. The next day he awakens, goes out to the hunt and returns once again to find smoke coming from the chimney. He carefully opens the door and once again there is food on the hearth, but this time standing at the sink, washing the dishes, is a striking woman with red hair and piercing green eyes. She is singing a song that is old as it is beautiful. 
in a language spoken from a time of elders from a time long ago. As he takes off his coat to hang it on the peg on the back of the door, he notices a luxurious fox pelt hanging on the second peg. And the woman looks at him as he does so and says, I am the woman of this house. It is a statement that is neither demanding nor plaintive. It is a simple fact. She nods to the pelt hanging on the peg and she says, that pelt is a part of me. My only demand that while I am in this house is that the pelt rests on the door. The hunter has no issue with this. Simply nods. And the fox woman invites him to sit and join him for a meal and she tells him tales from ages ago that amuse and intrigue. She sings songs to him that lift his soul, bringing him to tears and laughter. She listens to his worries and his joys with interest and concern. Now a fox pelt, my friends, is a beautiful thing. But for those unfamiliar, a fox pelt has an odor a bit of a smell, a musk, you might say. And at first, the hunter pays it no mind. But as the wonder of her company becomes routine, he notices the odor of this pelt more and more. It becomes so strong that it is the first thing he notices in the morning and the last thing on his mind before he drifts to sleep. He smells it in his clothes throughout the day as he wanders the woods. And it begins to nag at him. One evening as they are having dinner, he says to her, I do love your company. And I love so much about you and what you bring to this home. But I was wondering about your pelt. I know it's dear to you, but could we please, since the odor is so strong, maybe hang it outside or in the shed, somewhere other than in my home? And the fox woman looks at him with her sharp eyes, with a look that is definitive without being menacing or stern, and says, the pelt is a part of me and it will hang on the door for as long as I am the woman of this house. The hunter knows better than to argue, and the two of them continue their evening, as usual. Weeks go by. And one day, the hunter returns from the hunt, and it has not been a good hunt. Everything that could have gone wrong did and his mood is spoiled. He enters the cabin and is hit with the smell of that pelt. And he just snaps. I told you to get rid of that. And the fox woman looks at him and nods silently. That night they eat in silence, go to bed, and the next morning, when the hunter awakes, before he even opens his eyes, he notices that the smell is gone. And when he opens his eyes, he notices that every trace of the fox woman is gone. His cabin returned to the state it was before she had ever come. There are those who say that the hunter to this day can still be found in the doorway of his cabin, hoping, praying to catch the scent of the pelt one more time.
Recently, the city of Springfield, Ohio, has made headlines because of a recent influx of Haitian immigrants. An outlandish story has been making the rounds that the immigrant community in Springfield has been eating the pets of their neighbors. It is a lie. Do not mistake that I give that story any credibility. What is true is that the recent influx of Haitian immigrants was due to the city's plans to attract businesses. When the businesses arrived told that the cost of living in Springfield, Ohio was lower and was a great place for them to do business, what did they need? Workers. And the small Haitian community already in Springfield let their Haitian friends and family who were not in the city know. And what did they do? They answered the call. They came to work. This was the gift Springfield was looking for. Their plan to revitalize the city was working. It was as if someone had come into their home and started doing all of the chores and cooking them stew. However, when you have a sudden influx of citizens, it is going to cause a drain on your resources. Housing costs are going to rise because you may not be able to build new homes, affordable new homes, fast enough. Roads are going to be clogged. Schools are going to have an influx of new students and clouded, crowded classrooms. That influx of new citizens is a lot to handle. Add to that, these people are culturally different from those who have lived in the city previously. Many of these immigrants do not speak English well. Their mannerisms, their culture is unfamiliar to the people of the city. And when you add those differences with the inconveniences of traffic and crowding, what do you do? You start to focus on the things you don't like. You forget all about the benefits that the fox woman brings you, and you focus on the pelt. Now, I have hope for Springfield. I am optimistic that in a few years, once all of the tax revenue from all of these new citizens starts coming in, that the city will be able to handle all of these issues that arose. They can build a few more schools, more houses, expand the roads. They can maybe even get a new hospital. Yes, these things will take time. And I can see it happening. Hopefully, that will lessen some of the anxiety that Springfield is experiencing. But what does concern me is one thing will not change. And that is the fact that these new citizens of Springfield are Haitian. For some, the only way for some in that city, the only way the Haitian community can be accepted as, is if they behave differently? Maybe they lose their accent? Maybe they just keep their traditions inside their homes? We don't want to see that. Maybe they just behave like all the people who have lived here before. I love all you do for this city, but I'm wondering, could you hang your pelt outside the cabin? to truly invite someone into your home, into the entirety of your life, is disruption. 
I'm not talking about guests, people who stay for a few hours, share a meal, and perhaps a night in the guest room or on the couch. And while it is a delight to host someone for a small amount of time, eventually you know they're going to leave. And you will go back to your usual routines and habits. You don't need to change anything. If anything, you prepared for their arrival by stocking your fridge and sweeping the dust from the corners. And when they leave, you will be happy to let the dust settle again. Living with someone is a different story. Most of us have had the experience of inviting somebody new to come into our house to stay. Maybe it's a new sibling when you were younger. Maybe you have to welcome a new step-parent or a possible new step-parent into your home while you're growing up. Maybe in your early 20s you had a roommate. Maybe you've had to move in with a partner or wanted to move in with a partner. Even under the most amicable of conditions, to live with someone for the first time is a shock. Settling the most minute details that pop up when people live together. How many arguments have you had about how to load the dishwasher? How many arguments have you ever had to go, that's not where that goes in the fridge. That goes on this shelf, not that shelf. What is the right amount of clutter that your partner can handle before they start to get on you or before you start to get on them? There are a thousand little details that we never think about until a different perspective arrives and inhabits the same space as us. And what do we do? We long for the comfort of doing things that have always suited us without having to compromise. And when that happens, we are left with a choice. We can continue to clean our house on our own, mend our own clothes, cook our own food, without the company of a fantastic person who shares their stories, sings their songs, and enriches our lives. We can go without that. Or, we can learn to accept both the beauty and the musk that the pelt brings. We can stagnate or we can transform. Our opening reading spoke of holy disruption. To welcome those things that change and challenge our perspective on how things are supposed to be, to upset all of the plans and routines that we have in our lives and to see what gifts are offered by difference, by challenge, by change. To truly welcome the stranger is not to invite them in for the afternoon tea and send them out the door by dinner. To accept all of the positives they bring is to truly welcome to stranger, to set aside their differences when they make us uncomfortable, to live in a world where all are welcome and valued. We must learn to accept all of a person, including their pelt. Because the truth of it is, all of us, have a pelt. All of us carry a difference. We all have a part of ourselves that is integral to who we are, who our identity is. And that part can be difficult for people not like us to understand. And no one 
wants to be asked to hide their pelt. As a faith, we Unitarian Universalists have struggled with this idea of transformation that is needed to be truly welcoming to those who are different from the norm. We've struggled. This faith has not always welcomed women in leadership. This faith has not always embraced LGBTQIA plus folks. This faith did not always embrace people of color. And yes, we may be further ahead on these issues than other faiths, but friends, we did not start transformed. We were asked to make these changes, and we did not simply flip a switch, say yes, okay, and be done. It took a lot of patience from those who were being asked to hide their pelts. It took a lot of patience from them. And it took a lot of soul searching from those people who owned the cabin. And in the end, we as a faith decided that the work of transformation, of changing ourselves to be more welcoming to all was worth it. That we are truly better together, pelts and all. Transformation is needed by all of us. Transformation done in the name of justice, of pluralism, of interdependence is needed. And it is not simple work. It requires a lot of hard self-examination. It requires a willingness to change. It requires a genuine curiosity to understand the other. And as a faith, we know, each and every one of us, in our hearts, that we are better sitting at that table, listening to those wondrous tales and those songs of the fox woman than we are ever if we are standing in the doorway wondering if she will ever return. May we be so. We're all in this together, friends. And so we need to sing like we're all in this together. I can't leave you on that note. Let's sing our favorite song, folks. This is the free bird of Unitarian Universalism. Please rise in body or spirit as we joyfully sing the goal of being together in this world, being on our blue boat home.
I love y'all. I do. I've been watching you this morning, and it is a delight to look at all of your faces. So many of your lives, to know so many things about you all. And each one of you is different. Each one of you has your own things about you that is unique and beautiful. And what I want us all to remember is everybody carries that. There is a lot of polarization going on in this world, my friends, especially now and especially for the next four weeks. And we have neighbors who we love and disagree with at the same time. You don't have to love everything about them. You don't have to agree with everything. But you need to see the beauty in them just a little bit just to know that there is something inside that they are worthy. Something small, maybe. Because each of you has the same thing. See the beauty in each other, my friends. We're all in this together. May it be so.